Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Ashley DeBraccio, the program assistant here at NHD, and I am joined by my colleague, Elena McNaughton, our contest manager here at NHD. And we are so excited to have our friends from Retro Report, including David Olson, the director of education, and Isadora, Isadora Fierro. If she can pronounce that for me correctly, I would really appreciate it. That is very now. <laughs> it's Portuguese. I love it. And one day I promise I will learn to say it. And she is the uh, engagement producer at Retro Report. And they're going to talk to you about debate and diplomacy and some topics that you might discover that they have access to and they have lesson plans and other topic ideas for you for your upcoming NHD 2022 project. So before I toss it over to them, I'm just going to go through a couple quick housekeeping items, and then I'm going to let them get started. So a couple of things. We do not have a chat box, but we have a Q&A box. And so if you've got questions relating to NHD, whether it's programs or contest related, feel free to drop those in the box. Also, if you have questions for our guests from Retro Report, please drop those in the Q&A box. We will be tossing questions to them at the end. So if you think of anything or you'd like to learn more, please feel free to put those questions there. Additionally, we do have live captioning turned on today. If that doesn't work or it's very distracting on your screen, you can go to the live transcription box and turn it off. Um, we have it set up for some people who have requested it, but please keep in mind the live transcription is not done by a human. It is done by a robot, and so it will not get every word correctly, but we're going to try and make sure that it captures as much of our voices as we can. Additionally, we will have a survey, um, one from NHD and one from Retro Report at the end, and we'll have those links up. If you could help us out and give us feedback on what you thought of this webinar, we would really appreciate it. And finally, we will email out the link and any materials to you tomorrow so that you have all of this available to you to rewatch and kind of browse for yourself. All right, so this is the point where I am going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to turn it over to David at Retro Report. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Ashley. Uh, and thank you, Ashley and Elena, for, for inviting Isadora and us and I here today uh, to talk to you about Retro Report. Um, before we get started and tell you about who we are um, and, and what our mission is, um, Ashley, this is your cue for those poll questions. Um, I'd love to, to hear a, a little bit from, from folks in the audience of uh, who you are, what your background is, um, and some things you're hoping to, to get out of this, including how familiar are you with, uh, with Retro Report? Great. So those are, those are on your screen. The first one is what level do you teach? Middle school, high school, post-secondary, or you're not a classroom teacher. How familiar are you with Retro Report, including what the heck is Retro Report? I've heard of it, but I'm excited to learn more. I've seen or used Retro Report in my classroom. Step aside, Dave, I should lead this webinar. And three, what best describes what you're hoping to learn today? I'm just here for PD credit. I'm just starting NHD and I need some ideas. I'm an NHD veteran here and here for new tricks, or I need examples to spark my students' curiosity. So go ahead and drop your answers into those questions, and we'll see where we are with our audience today. I know, I was I was super mean and did not give you more than one option on that last <laughs> question. So it has to be, you know, like you tell all of your students, pick the one that fits best, even though multiple may be correct. All right, get your answers in. You have five more seconds and I'm gonna close that poll and see where we stand. All right, let's see what we've got here. It looks like uh, we're, we're leaning high school heavy and we do have some NHG students in the audience who are not nice. classroom teachers. Um, we have a couple who have said, what the heck is Retro Report? So <laughs> Dave and Isadora are going to fill you in on that. We, yeah, we are in the right place. <laughs> And some of some who have heard of Retro Report but are excited to learn more. And finally, they're NHD veterans um, who are majority learning, looking for new tricks, um, some that are just starting NHD, and some that need new examples for NHD 2022. Awesome. So I am going to uh, go ahead and, and share my screen. Uh, we'll make sure 
we've got it we're, we're looking at the presentation fantastic um so a little bit here um uh, about me so my name is uh, is david olson i'm the uh, director of education at at retro report um isadora would you like to to introduce yourself Sure. My name is Isadora. I'm the engagement producer at Retro Report. And, um, you know, Dave joined us less than three months ago, and he's already causing a revolution at the company, introducing us to hundreds of teachers with his amazing resources. But a year ago, we started Retro Report in the classroom and, um, and reached out to so many teachers at NHD to understand how we could serve you well. And we're always in that quest to learn from you. What could we do for us? So, you know, Dave's gonna talk about it, but we have a newsletter. We would love to hear your feedback after this webinar and we'd, would love to stay in touch with you to learn how you're gonna use these resources or not for your National History Day journey. Absolutely, we, uh, we are here to support teachers with high quality free resources, um, amazing videos, all of those sorts of things. Um, and what helps us do our job is, is feedback from, from teachers uh, and feedback from students to say, here's what works for us um, and, and here are things that we need from you at Retro Report to, to be able to do our jobs well. Um, so yes, as Isidore noted, um, I have been with Retro Report now for, for just a few months, um, but I, I come from the classroom. So I spent uh, more than a, a decade previously uh, in my last role as a as a high school social studies teacher um i did not have the the great pleasure and honor and awesome responsibility of of leading students through uh nhd um although i i'm well familiar with uh with the program um and i have some amazing colleagues who who have introduced me to to the wonderful world of all of those projects and really more important than the projects, the, the process uh, of going through and conducting research and putting together a story. So um, my goal today is to introduce you to Retro Report, uh, to talk to you about how Retro Report fits in uh, with, uh, with this year's theme specifically, um, and to, to look at how can we help teachers and students on that journey of learning how to do research, learning how to find and tell very interesting stories. So what is Retro Report? I'm, I'm glad you asked. So uh, Retro Report is, is now a, an organization that's uh, about eight, nine years old. Um, and it really is, is born from uh, this mission of, of nonprofit high quality journalism. Uh, specifically, Retro Report focuses on creating short form documentary films. Um, and, and really the vast majority of their films um, find really unique, interesting, engaging ways to link past and present, to find what are those stories from history that are, are interesting and have application in our world today, but also what are some of those really important things happening today and how can, how can we look to history to understand the moment that we're in? So really this is the, the mission of Retro Report. And as Isadora noted, um, about a year or so uh, ago, the Retro Report began this initiative to, to try to do a better job of connecting with teachers um, and connecting with classrooms. Um, so they hired a teacher uh, to, to help sort of bring some of that to life. Uh, so here, the, the thing I love about Retro Report and, and why I was uh, eager to join the folks at Retro Report was their focus on amazing journalism, but through the lens of storytelling. So what you're gonna see today are uh, clips from a handful of our films um, and storytelling really is this amazing basis for those films. Uh, in all, Retro Report has a library of over 250 films, all of which can be found entirely free uh, at retroreport.org. Um, we also have an education side to our website where we have a, a, a narrower group of, uh, of films that we feel are, are really good for the classroom, along with some supporting resources with, with much more to come. Um, like I said, we have this growing collection of uh, not only our films, but lesson plans and student activities to accompany them. Um, and there is much, much more to come on the education side. Um, I'll be talking a bit more about that, including um, some ways that we would be, we're looking for teachers to help us uh, and to be involved in, in some of the work that we do. 
All right. So why bother to use Retro Report? There, there are a number of good video sources out there. Um, you can, I mean, frankly, you can spend hours and hours and hours searching YouTube for related videos and things that could connect to the content of your classroom. Um, my pitch to you today is uh, find a way to start at Retro, Retro Report, um, in part because Retro Report starts with story. Um, storytelling is at the heart of of all that we do and there are these engaging and amazing stories with great interviews uh this guy here on the screen uh colonel halverson you'll hear from him in a in a bit with a, a story connected to the berlin airlift um amazing human being with a great story to tell um again uh you can find free resources out there, um, but uh, the Retro Report resources not only are free, but they're a combination of what we know are, are really highly engaging and effective uh, materials in, in great videos um, and accompanies them with lesson plans, activities, uh, and, and a growing list of events, webinars about how to use Retro Report materials uh, in the future, you know, gatherings of educators and additional trainings for, for how to use Retro Report in your classroom. Um, this is one of the things we hear most often from teachers of, of why Retro Report works for them. It's the right length. Right. Uh, there, there are plenty of great documentaries out there um, and you can find plenty that are an hour, two hours, sometimes three or more. I'm a big Ken Burns fan, uh, but but trying to find ways to incorporate Ken Burns documentaries into the classroom, really difficult when I don't have, uh, you know, two months to spend on uh, on the Civil War. Um, so retro report films are all in this five to 12 minute window. Um, and usually most of them are in that like eight to 12 minute range. So they are really good uh, for the classroom. You can show a video as a hook. You can show a video as, uh, as uh, the beginning or the middle of a lesson. Um, and it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be the whole class period that you can do other things along with uh, the introduction of that material. Uh, one of the other amazing things uh, with Retro Report is uh, all of our films are fact checked. In fact, we uh, we employ fact checkers uh, to go through all of our films uh, to to make sure that what we're putting out to you uh, is indeed true uh, and fair. We we think we do a very good job of of bridging. Uh, history and civics and current events. Um, I am very passionate. Uh, and when I was in the classroom, I wanted to start every class of mine by asking my students what's happening in the world? What do we need to know? Um, and, and to find ways to link what's happening in their world at this moment to what we needed to know from history and uh, in government classes, in a criminal justice class I taught, whether it was world history, uh, sociology, anything. Um, finding ways to connect students, uh, what their lived experience is with the, the history behind it that they need to know is always an effective way to, to go about things. And uh, what I've found in, in sort of finding ways to connect uh, history and civics and current events is it almost always answers the, the question from students, that age old question of why does it matter? Why do I need to study this? Well, if you can find a way to, to build that bridge for students, it answers that question for them over and over again. All right, so um, a couple couple resources here with uh, with National History Day. Um, a while ago, we we had some folks at Retro Report put together an educator's guide that, um, and we'll we'll share this with you. I think Isadora is going to find a way to to share that uh, in the Q and A. The link to that full educator's guide, which talks about a whole bunch of uh, our films on on the education side of the website, um, along with some of the guiding questions and things that go with it. Um, when I think about the connection between Retro Report and National History Day, um, immediately I think of how are you going to, as teachers, how are we going to spark the imagination, uh, spark the, the inquiry in our students uh, to have them go, oh, 
here's something I want to learn more about. Here's a, here's a question I want to answer. Um, and I think Retro Report films do a really good job of, of modeling that spark, uh, of saying, look, there are these great stories out there or great questions out there, um, and then let's explore it further. Um, so uh, they do a great job of, of engaging students uh, to tell a story, to conduct research, to, to approach the, the nuance of a story um, and, and make that connection. Um, when, when you look, now I know uh, teachers, you're, you're probably at the beginning of your journey with your students and their National History Day projects. If we have students uh, who are joining us here, you might be going, oh man, I really could use some, some inspiration or some ideas. Um, but when it comes time to connecting to that actual evaluation for National History Day itself, there are a ton of places where Retro Report uh, helps make that connection between uh, the research you're doing and how you will ultimately be evaluated on these projects. So as an example, what you'll see in the, the clips of, of Retro Report films that we check out today are a ton of primary sources. You will see archival images, uh, video clips, you will see interviews. Um, you will hear multiple perspectives, right? That's another big part of the NHD evaluation is, are you telling a one-sided story or are you exploring an issue, an event, uh, an example of debate or diplomacy from multiple angles? Um, and you'll see that again, modeled really well by, by the Retro Report filmmakers. Um, what is the historical context and is it accurate? Again, this is our bread and butter. It's what are those stories that are interesting? What are the issues that are important today? And then how do we explore the history behind it to make it make sense uh, for, for our viewers? And then uh, last but not least, uh, this is where, you know, I think Retro Report, as it bridges to here's why it matters, right? Here's what it means for us today. It's that same thing we ask uh, NHD students to do. Tell us the significance. You've told us a story, you've analyzed a moment in history, but why is it important? So I, hopefully, uh, with some of those things in mind, you'll see how Retro Report uh, makes those connections for students um, and, and provides a really good model as you're, as you're trying to spark some of that inquiry uh, as they begin their projects. And then what we, what we have for you at Retro Report, like I said, we have a, a library of over 250 short films, uh, but we do have a number of, of collections. So teachers, if you're doing NHD, um, you know, whether it's uh, purely as an as a extracurricular activity, whether it's part of a US history or a world history course, um, we have some places uh, where you can look to, to sort of begin and see, are there Retro Report films that, that might fit? Uh, and beyond that, plenty of other things to connect uh, to whatever class you might be teaching. Um, so we have a, a collection looking at different uh, political conventions and some, some landmark elections. So some of the ones included there uh, dating all the way back to 1860 and as recent as 2000. Although, listen, I, I graduated from high school in the year 2000. Uh, I know that standing in front of middle and high schoolers today they think that 2000 is uh, is ancient history, so I, I get it. Uh, but a number of really good films here uh, centering on uh, conventions and elections. Um, one of my favorites, I am a self-professed political nerd. Um, I love political ads. Um, and there is a whole retro report series focusing on some really important groundbreaking um, and uh, sometimes provocative political ads, particularly in presidential races. Uh, there's more than these three, but these three are you know probably ones most most folks in the audience will recognize. Uh, that that famous Daisy Girl ad run only one time by by the Johnson campaign, uh, Reagan's famous Morning in America ad, and uh, and the Willie Horton ad run by uh, George H. W. Bush's campaign. Um, we also have uh, a number of films focusing on various aspects of civil rights, um, and we have some that you know focus on you know like lesser 
lesser known events uh, of you know the outreach uh, and activism of Martin Luther King to more broad topics like issues of busing, uh, housing discrimination, uh, voting, particularly uh, disenfranchisement of uh, Black women. Um, so a number of places to focus in the civil rights realm. Um, this is one we're, we're particularly proud of. We we uh, partnered with Gilder Lerman to create some material for um, uh, two, two different sessions they ran of a Cold War course uh, for students as part of their history school program. Um, you'll see an excerpt of one of those films today. Maybe two are part of that collection. Um, and, and some really great, great ones here. Uh, these ones actually tend to run a little shorter. Um, they were not our traditional retro reports, but ones that we did as, as part of this partnership. Um, so you'll see the Berlin airlift or a portion of it, um, uh, focus on the Korean War, on McCarthyism, and there are several others in that series as well, including one that focuses on the, on the space race and another that focuses on uh, nuclear war. Um, Again, my inner government nerd uh, loves this series. There's a, a whole set that focus on, on public policy and say, how do these different events in history actually connect to changes in policy? And this, I'll talk a little bit more about it as we go on. Um, these are places I see a direct connection for uh, those debates uh, for NHD projects, right? What are these moments in history that we can trace a direct line to a change in public policy? Um, how can we focus on this event to understand this part of our world today? Um, so we'll we'll see a little bit of one about uh, a very infamous garbage barge and how it really led to uh, much greater rates of recycling throughout the country. Um, there are some other very timely ones in there, including uh, one about vaccine hesitancy um, and where that stems from. Um, we also have a really good series focusing on environmental science, um, looking at things like the chemical DDT, uh, fires in uh, Yellowstone National Park, um, Love Canal, uh, which was a, a toxic waste spill. Um, so really good resources. And then since I've come on, uh, one of the things we created um, which was was very timely here was a series for teaching about September 11th. Um, not only uh, the attacks on September 11th, but the war on terror uh, that comes after. So we have four different films in that package, each uh, including um, a lesson plan with a, a digital student activity. Um, and there's also an interactive timeline that's part of that collection as well. Also, as I'm rambling here, it'll be interspersed with at least a few film clips. But if you have questions, want to know additional things about Retro Report, or want to say, hey, Dave, repeat this because I didn't understand that part at all, uh, make sure you drop it in the Q&A. We'll be, we'll be happy to answer those for you. So I'm going to take you through a couple different examples of debates, diplomacy, at least one that sort of bridges the two here. Um, as I mentioned, I think this is a, a definite strength of Retro Report. It finds these amazing stories to tackle very nuanced issues um, and, and to do so in, in a way that's fair, that's engaging, um, and that, you know, as the, the mark of what we want uh, our students to do often leaves us with you know, no clear answer, or sometimes more questions than answers. Um, and so what we'll see here is, uh, is this story about wild horses in the American West. Um, and it's really the story of uh, the environment, uh, pits environmental activists versus uh, cattle ranchers and sheep ranchers in the West, um, and the unintended consequences of what happens when we try to address these things with, uh, with public policy. So we're going to see a, a short two-minute segment here. Um, I want you to think about, you know, what is the debate um, and how are you, what are the ways in which you're trying to get students to engage with multiple perspectives? Um, what can you do to try to get them to, to tackle things from multiple sides? So how did the situation get so tense that the federal government is sending in herders in helicopters to mediate this standoff? It's a classic tale of unintended consequences. 
1970, the wild horse population had fallen from approximately a million at the turn of the century to less than 18,000. Victim of a pet food industry hungry for cheap meat. Get that horse! The 1961 movie, The Misfits, dramatized the brutality of capturing wild horses, a practice which enraged a growing number of animal lovers. The Mustang, maybe more than any other animal in America, is a symbol. It means freedom. It means defiance. It means scrappy but noble. In a sense, it means us, right? It is the American. And to have something that we hold in such esteem at the same time, not only abused, okay, but turned into dog well, food, was just something that people could not deal with in their minds. Knowing that animals were being hunted down, slaughtered, butchered, and sold as pet food just really burned me up. Greg Goody was a young boy when he discovered the plight of the Mustang in the pages of an illustrated children's book. Its main character was a tenacious Nevada activist with a catchy nickname. Velma Johnston has fought for the protection of these animals all her life, and she is known as Wild Horse Annie. Wild Horse Annie enlisted school children in a national letter writing campaign. By some accounts, they flooded Congress that year with a volume of letters second only to mail received about the Vietnam War. But Greg Goody didn't need to write letters. His father, Gilbert Goody, held one of Maryland's seats in the U.S. House of Representatives. I lived with my congressman. I could lobby at the dinner table. I think it probably took a hunger strike. An 11-year-old boy persuaded his father, a congressman, to introduce a bill to protect wild horses and burros on the Western Plains. Then the boy, Greg Good of Maryland, appeared today to testify. And so, a few months later, in December of 1971, the wild horses were saved. All right. Quick check with uh, with folks and, and maybe Ashley and Elena. Uh, things good so far? Did that uh, come through OK? All right. I'm getting the thumbs yes. up. All right. <laughs> we, we will keep going. Um, screen sharing always an adventure uh no matter no matter where you are here all right so that's one example of a debate um i encourage you go watch the rest of that film um it basically looks at how this law to protect wild horses in the american west has led to this massive overabundance of wild horses in the american west to the point where uh the federal government currently spends millions of dollars a year um to sort of round up horses uh to to well house seems like an odd term uh but to to board to to feed these horses um and then still often has to turn around and try to find homes permanent homes and sell these horses uh which it often isn't successful at doing so um wonderful story well i don't know if it's a wonderful story overall but it's a great story that highlights unintended consequences, how debates happen, and how things maybe don't always turn out the, the way we expect them to. Um, another example here with, uh, with looking at debates are those historical connections today. To answer that question, how did we get here uh, to this moment in time? Um, so the, the film clip we're gonna see next is uh, from a film entitled The Roots of Recycling. Um, so how did this one bizarre moment involving a garbage barge uh, lead to something far more impactful, uh, like the sort of widespread use of recycling in places across the country? Um, so here, you know, this, this is a really good model of, of asking your students to, to go find interesting stories and, and understand why they might be significant. How do they impact a larger public policy? Like a magnet for refuse, the barge by now had collected over six million pounds of trash from all over Long Island and New York City. Everybody's garbage. Everybody had a problem getting rid of their garbage. And we were the best game, I guess, at the time. At that point in time, everything looked so good. It was the start of something that I had great hopes for. Harrelson predicted profits for disposing of the Mobro's load in the first place, and eventually for generating electricity for the methane gas created as the garbage decomposed. It was an idea that I had read about. A lot of experts said it's a coming thing. 
So I just arbitrarily on my own decided to give it a whirl. But on April Fool's Day, shortly after the barge docked in North Carolina, a local TV news reporter was at the scene and sparked an outcry. The first call we got was, you're shipping New York City's rats down to us. And I said, no, first there was no rats on it. No one said a barge load of waste. It was a barge load of New York waste. As Jaswali remembers it, the pivotal moment came when a state environmental official spotted a bedpan on the barge. And they claimed, because of the bedpan, that the barge had hospital waste. So we were told to get it out of there. The barge then headed for a landfill in Louisiana. But when it got there, state officials again barred it from unloading. There could be infectious waste from hospitals. There could be hazardous waste. A homeless garbage barge. That's when the story exploded. Dripping brown ooze of possibly infectious material. The governor of Louisiana threatened to send out the National Guard if the barge tied up there. The vagabond barge has become an international issue. The most watched load of garbage in the memory of man. Six ports have already refused the refuse. The barge has been chased away by the warplanes of two nations, and now it's anchored here, five miles off the coast of Key West, Florida still loaded with tons of garbage, still on water. All right. I, I think my, my absolute favorite line in there is a garbage barge chased away by the warplanes of two nations. Uh, so if you go watch the rest of that film, uh, one of the things you'll see is how uh, the, the hysteria and the media attention of this particular garbage barge um, allows an organization like Greenpeace uh, to um, to, to use this to its advantage to, to try to spread its message about recycling um, and really how the the idea of all of the dumps, all of the uh, landfills are filling up actually wasn't quite true. Um, and and there was much more to this story that ended up influencing uh, public policy across the country. All right. Now we move to to diplomacy. Um, and if you've if you've seen nothing else in these last two clips, uh, hopefully you, you've noticed that Retro Report does an amazing job of finding compelling characters. Um, we we have an uncanny ability to find amazing people to tell their own stories um, and connect us to the history. Uh, this this next one is is no exception. Um, here, I think as you're having students or encouraging students to, to engage with ideas of diplomacy um, and diplomatic actions, the important part is it's more than just the policy, the event, right? Their project is not just here's the treaty that was signed um, or here's the negotiation that occurred, uh, but it's more than that. It's it's the human stories that impact those policies, those events, uh, to make a difference for all sorts of, of people moving afterwards. So what we're gonna see here is a, a, a wonderful, heartwarming, compelling story uh, about the Berlin airlift and about how uh, decisions of individual humans and their actions end up influencing the public perception of events. Gail Halverson was one of the American pilots who volunteered to airlift food into Berlin. At the time, I was having difficulty in a relationship with a girlfriend of long-term standing. And uh, I decided I just will be over there is over here. One day, after landing in Berlin, Halverson started talking to a group of German kids standing at the fence line. I went over a little ways to meet the kids. I was impressed with them. Ten plus or minus two years old, and they just to say, "Hey, uh, we we don't want, we don't want to go to the Soviets. We'll do anything. Just don't give up on us." Kids that age, knowing the importance of free agency, the ability to govern yourself, they said, "Just don't worry about us. Someday we'll have enough to eat." But if we lose our freedom, we'll never get it back. And uh, I marveled at that. Halverson wanted to give them something, but he only had two sticks of gum. So he broke them in half and told the children to keep an eye out for his plane the next go around. Well, I knew what it was like to be cut off and uh, to be out on the end of the string. And so 
So I, it was just a no-brainer to, to drop the chocolate bars to the kids in West Berlin that didn't have any. I was elated. I saw Gail Halverson's airplane wiggling the wings and we all waved. We called him the Schokoladenbomber, the chocolate bomb. And then we saw these parachutes coming out of his airplane. Of course, there were more children than parachutes and the boys were always faster. But that was not, that was not important. The important thing was, this was something hopeful happening to us. This was like, you know, in those ruins, all of a sudden flowers came to bloom. The newspaper guy was there covering the kids and was airlift and all of a sudden he looked up above and parachutes and candy bars were coming down. And he had that on the news right away and the colonel called me and said, Alverson, what are you doing over Berlin? Well, and I knew he knew. I said, I'm dropping candy to the kids. He says, well, keep it up and keep me informed. Candy companies were super. They sent over all I could drop, and uh, we had all our pilots tying up packs of parachutes. We'd even drop some in East Berlin. The Soviets complained about that. And we just kept doing it in West Berlin. I love it. I, I he's don't you just want to like reach through and give him a hug? He's such a wonderful man. And I also I love the the fact that. Somewhere in that interview, uh, the filmmaker was like, oh, Mr. Halverson, tell me, how did you become the chocolate bomber? And the story begins with, well, I wasn't getting along with my girlfriend, so I decided to go to World War II. So uh, just a, a wonderful story. Uh, also, it, you know, it's this great connection between an individual human action uh, that ends up having a, a much greater impact and is this wonderful little story as part of a much bigger diplomatic story. So uh, the the second to last one I'll, I'll show you here, I think does a really good job of, of bridging this idea of debate and diplomacy or figuring out how does diplomacy or sometimes the lack thereof uh, end up having an impact on debates that we have. Um, and so here, as we see uh, this, this snippet of a film about uh, the use of the chemical Agent Orange uh, in Vietnam, um, we're going to see how, uh, you know, the way that the U.S. attempted to carry out the war in Vietnam uh, ended up having far-reaching impacts, uh, not only diplomatic impacts with, uh, with uh, the country of Vietnam, both at the time and even still today, uh, but impacting some of the political, social, and economic debates uh, around how we wage war and uh, what do we owe it to uh, the people who wage war on our behalf. Um, so here, we'll, we'll take a look at a, a snippet of this film as well. One of the most controversial American operations in Vietnam. Just the name of it evokes all sorts of horrible images, Agent Orange. During the Vietnam War, Americans were told that spraying millions of acres of dense jungle with Agent Orange would deprive the Viet Cong of cover and save GI's lives. But in the decades since, the herbicide's use in Vietnam has been blamed for creating a human catastrophe among veterans. I died in Vietnam and didn't even know it. And the Vietnamese. Vietnam is convinced that these children are just the latest victims of the deadly chemical dioxin in Agent Orange. Now, more than 40 years later, the fight over Agent Orange continues to take new turns. Americans might like to consider our war in Vietnam to be ancient history. It's not ancient history. During the Vietnam War, the U.S. military fought an invisible enemy. Viet Cong fighters who quickly attacked, then slipped back into the dense jungle. In 1962, American forces responded with Operation Ranch Hand. Over the next nine years, spraying an area about the size of Massachusetts with defoliants, the most notorious being Agent Orange. 
It was one way we were going to win the Vietnam War, dump herbicides all over the jungle so the Viet Cong would come out and fight. To both expose Viet Cong hiding places and deprive them of life-sustaining crops, large swaths of Vietnam were left barren. Enough food to feed 600,000 people for a year has been destroyed. Despite this sudden devastation, U.S. officials said the spraying created no lasting harm, and many agreed it was helping turn the tide on the Viet Cong. What they're doing amounts to a pretty important form of conservation in itself, the saving of American lives. But the communist North Vietnamese presented a different picture of Agent Orange, one that became increasingly horrific as time wore on. North Vietnam charged today that defoliants have produced many instances of miscarriages, congenital defects, and monstrosities among children. The U.S. government initially dismissed these charges as communist propaganda, but following a study that linked dioxin, a contaminant in Agent Orange, to birth defects in laboratory animals, the spraying of this herbicide was discontinued in 1970. The herbicide was also eventually banned in the U.S. That did not stop the growing concern about Agent Orange, which took a new turn a few years after the last American soldier had left Vietnam in 1975. Milton Ross, a special forces advisor near Play Coup, has a son born without the tips of his fingers. Frank Moore is nearly dead from cancer. He thinks the cancer was caused by chemical defoliants he was exposed to as a soldier in Vietnam. Thousands of Vietnam veterans think Agent Orange is now killing them. I know that one wasn't nearly as uplifting as the uh, Berlin airlift piece, but I think does does a very good job. And like I said, the I'm showing you snippets of each of these, although none of them are are more than you know 11, 12 minutes long. Um, the the end of this piece really makes that connection to things that are still happening today in our relationship with uh, with the country of Vietnam, um, and and trying to you know, figure out what sort of atonement or change or, uh, you know, a way to address this situation, uh, because people in Vietnam are very much still feeling the effects of Agent Orange. And likewise, we still have uh, former soldiers in the United States who are dealing with the effects of exposure to Agent Orange. The, the last way um, I, I want to talk about connecting Retro Report to National History Day um, is really this focus on skills, right? Uh, you might have plenty of students who come to you with these great ideas of great stories that, the, that they think ought to be shared, um, really interesting moments in time to analyze. Uh, and then the next step is how do I help these students build their skills so that they can become, you know, budding historians and researchers uh, so they can turn this mountain of primary and secondary source evidence into something coherent. And as they're, you know, heading out onto Google, how can they determine if the information uh, that they're encountering is legitimate and helpful uh, to the way that they're going to tell their story? Um, we believe you know, that, that information literacy is paramount. There are plenty of, of really good resources out there um, to, to encourage and teach information literacy with your students. Um, I think one of the things that makes Retro Report unique uh, is that we do employ a fact checker for for our films. Um, every single one of our films goes through this process of, of making sure that not only are the things that we are saying in the film true, uh, but are the people who speak on their own behalf saying things that are true? And are we avoiding taking them out of context? Are we giving you know the, the a reasonable interpretation? You know, if we interview someone for an hour and are taking you know 10 seconds of their time of that interview and putting it in the film is does that adequately represent uh what what they're saying these are the things that we do um and uh one of the things that's that's coming from retro report uh we're gonna have uh some lessons and activities uh to to sort of go through and model our process um and help students how to learn how to become fact checkers uh we also joe hogan who who just got a promotion to to official producer, uh, but we told him he's still on the hook uh, to to tell people about his fact checking process. Um, so for those of you who might be interested, um, 
he is available for speaking engagements uh, along with other uh, producers of our films. So we'll we'll have more information about how you can contact us. So here you get to be introduced to, to Joe Hogan. You hear a lot these days about fact checking. Fact checking. Fact checking. You got to do it. Fact checking. Is that true? Jake, it is indeed false. But what exactly is fact checking? How does it work? How do you fact check something that happened decades or even centuries ago? And why does it matter? To describe it simply, uh, fact checking is making sure that a claim is true. You take whatever sentence you're checking or whatever claim you're checking and you try to determine the best way to verify each fact. What you really have to do as a fact checker is approach each claim as a prosecutor would. You're putting the claim on trial and you want to get to a position where a judge and jury would say, yes, that claim is true. So let's say I have to fact check the following sentence. Donald Trump took the oath of office on Thursday, January 17th, 2017, wearing a fantastic blue tie. I would have to verify that Donald Trump did indeed take the oath of office, that he did it on January 17th, 2017, that January 17th, 2017 was a Thursday, that, that he was wearing a blue tie when he took the oath of office. The one claim that I wouldn't have to check is that the blue tie was fantastic because that's a statement of opinion. Um, and just for the record, uh, Trump took the oath of office on January 20th, that was a Friday, and he was wearing a red tie. That's a more recent example, but here's how you go about fact-checking something historical. You wanna get as close to the event as possible. So you don't necessarily wanna use articles written recently about the event because those haven't necessarily been fact-checked and they're far away from the event. Try to find newspaper accounts from the time, talk to people who were there, and try to verify what they say and what they remember as best you can with archival material, newspaper reports, things like that, images, video, or footage, film, from the event. The best way to fact check historical events that happened not 40 years ago, but 400 years ago, look to the work of historians. What sources do they cite? Often it'll be letters. It would be hard for, for me uh, just working on my computer to find a newspaper from the 1700s, but they exist in archives and historians have used them. So if at Retro Report, I check a claim about something that happened in, in a political convention in the 1800s, I do go to the work of historians and I check the All right. You hear a lot these days about. All right. So those are, are the video clips I, I have to show you. Um, I want to tell you in, we don't have a, a ton of time remaining here, but to tell you a little bit about what to expect um, in the in the coming months from, from Retro Report, and then some ways we'd, we'd love to connect with you and, and get involved. This is also a great time if you have questions um, about what Retro Report offers, um, have questions about any of the films that you saw or how to use Retro Report, uh, pop that in the Q&A. We would love to hear from you. So some of the things uh, coming up next from Retro Report, um, many more lessons and collections. Uh, some of the ones that are in the works right now are uh, some lessons and activities that go with that previous video, looking at fact checking, um, uh, some, some concrete ways to teach your students to, to go through that process um, and, and become mini fact checkers themselves. Um, we're working on a, a collection looking at the Cold War and the US connection in Latin America. Um, I know that you know the Cold War shows up in a number of different uh, a number of different places, uh, US history, world history. Um, but what is often missing is a is a connection and, and clear explanation with Latin America beyond the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, I did see a, a question here in the Q&A. Uh, is there a charge for Retro Report? Absolutely not. Um, our entire library of films, along with all of our classroom resources, lessons, activities, uh, interactives, all of that is, is open and free. Um, we're working on a, a collection um, and we'll be hosting another webinar looking at uh, 
gerrymandering. Um, this is, you know, that once in a decade period where uh, states have to go through this process of redrawing all their political boundaries, um, all of the congressional districts, all of the state legislative districts. Um, and we know that it has a, a great impact on, on politics um, and on who gets elected. Um, so we're putting together some resources there. Um, we'll be doing many more conferences and finding ways to network with teachers. So uh, actually over the next two months, I'll be presenting uh, virtually at the social studies conferences of Massachusetts and Kentucky. Um, also be uh, venturing in person uh, to present at the Texas conference for the social studies. Um, NCSS is another place where we will be an exhibitor. We will also have a session. Um, we're, we're doing another uh, National History Day webinar, this time with, uh, with Virginia National History Day. That one uh, will actually feature uh, Joe Hogan, who you saw in that last film, uh, to talk more about the fact-checking process. And by that point in October, we will have uh, those resources ready to go for teachers. Um, and then we also offer classroom visits, not only from Joe as the fact-checker, but uh, if, if there's a particular film that you really love are interested in in learning more about or having students uh, talk to that film producer um, that's something that that generally we can arrange or at least do our best to do um, and then uh, over the next several months here uh, we're going to be finding more ways to to reach out and connect with teachers so um, we're we're looking sort of at uh, a couple different models of of ways to connect with teachers as ambassadors as a group of teachers to serve as an advisory council for retro report um, to to help us do a better job of figuring out what needs we need to respond to in the social studies classrooms across the country but also uh, places like english and environmental science uh, and other places like that um, so one of the things that everyone here should do is make sure you sign up for uh, our, our newsletter it comes out once a week um, and and really it, it highlights hey here's a, a timely video or two here are upcoming events um, and that's a place where where we'll have uh, information and an application to join our teacher networks so we would love to stay in touch again i'm david olson the director of education at Retro Report, uh, joined today by Isadora Verjao, our engagement producer, uh, who's been putting some things there in the chat. Uh, and, and we've got a, a short link there for you uh, to go ahead and get connected to our newsletter. Um, and I can show you really quick what our, what our education page looks like. Uh, so if you come here to our the Retro Report education page, uh, you can go ahead and filter by topic, or you can go and scroll through our different videos and collections uh, to take a look at what we have. Um, on the education side, there's, oh, I think 50, maybe a few more than that, uh, videos that we've specifically said have, have a good connection uh, that we know to, to the classroom. Uh, but you can also go to the main Retro Report site um, here, if I do this, a video is going to play automatically here. Uh, but you can you can then go and look at uh, the entire library of of Retro Report films, um, which, like I said, there's over 250 uh, short form documentaries here for for people to check out. So uh, plenty of exploration to do um, if you if you liked what you saw through the the snippets I shared today. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Ashley and Elena. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. We actually did have a couple of questions come in from one from a teacher who was here but is having some Wi-Fi problems, so emailed in a question. Um, so she would like to know, do your videos include bibliographies or additional materials to help students start topic research? Ooh, great question. So. Um, as of now, most of the videos don't have a full-blown bibliography, but there's a there's a but here. So on a number of the films, um, there are like listed below, it'll be additional resources. So sometimes those are articles, um, they all come with a transcript. You can, I mean, one of the helpful things and ways to, to help your students learn how to start this process is 
you know, we have the the names of of all of the people that we're interviewing. So, you know, those are people they can go and find, especially if they're scholars to go figure out, OK, if Retro Report decided to interview them, it's probably because they're an expert on this topic. So now let's go and see what they've written, what they've produced. Um, great question. So, yeah, we don't have full blown bibliography, but definitely uh, some opportunities to model for your students how to how to start that investigation and that process. And one other question, how long does it take to produce a retro report video and what goes into the process? Oh, that's a great question. Isadora, you've been with retro report longer than I have. I mean, I, I can speak to this a little bit, but do you have any any insight for us? Well, it usually depends on the topic. I've seen some videos taking a year to be produced and some videos with a quick turnaround of you know, being produced in two months. Our process is very rigorous, like Dave said. We have, we have you know, every script um, is approved by a team of editors and producers who have worked in, you know, ABC 60 Minutes. It's a very strong and powerful team at Retro Report. A lot of experienced people with decades of experience so it's it's a very rigorous process, but it depends on the news cycle and depends on the topic. They are very, they don't back down when they want to interview someone and, and it's proven to be a little hard. They they do they do persevere and they often succeed. Um, and it's it's you know, Retropore usually partners with other news organizations like the New York Times and PBS and the New Yorker. To mention a few of the most recent ones so um it's like everything goes through a very um rigorous process of vetting that is fantastic well before we wrap up for the day i am going to quickly share my screen once more and ask if you could please help us out by sharing your feedback not only with us but also our friends at Retro Report. These are the two links right here. They will also go out in the email tomorrow that you'll receive just asking you if you can give your feedback and tell us what you really enjoyed about this webinar. So thank you so much for joining us today. If there are no other questions, we're going to wrap it up here, but we really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to come and join and learn about Retro Report. And a special thank you to Dave and Isadora for joining us and giving us the inside scoop of about what's happening at Retro Report and what's going to be happening in the future. So thank you so much. Happy to do so. Thanks for joining us, everyone.